Our next guest, 35th anniversary with acting, is celebrated this year. He has exercised his craft on the silver screen, the small screen, and the stage. His television credits include Monk, Law and Order, dun -dun, and Olive Kit Kitteridge. On stage, he has starred in such productions as The Cherry Orchard and A Midsummer Night's Dream. On film, you have seen him in movies such as State and Maine, Mystic River, Leaves of Grass, Shutter Island, and of course, The Invention of Lying. Why am I wearing clothes? Thank you very much to Ken Cheeseman for being here today. Thank you so much for coming in so early today, sir. Well, <laughs> thank for, you guys. Thanks for, for having me. With us. All right, so I know we, we discussed this a little previously, but I uh, want to put out there for the audience know we're going to be doing a challenge during this interview because the movie is The Invention of Lying. Um, so uh, we'd like you to give us any question of your choosing that we ask, um, make one of them a blatant lie. And uh, at the end of the uh, at the end of the interview, we'll try to decide which one was the lie yeah either you could either let us know we were right or wrong or we could just let that misinformation live out there for a while <laughs> oh okay I, I i got it wrong i thought i was supposed to to lie in answer to every question but one so i oh, have no, oh, I, the whole I, interview I, I, now. <laughs> I wish i wouldn't have clarified that would have been fantastic <laughs> i probably right, so. will anyway <laughs> Let's go for it. We'll, we'll figure this thing out. Now, the first thing probably is a lie, because according to IMDb, which has lied to us several times, your first credited acting role was in 1986. We were just three years old, not aging ourselves, playing Ken Corb in the made for TV movie, A Case of Deadly Force. But we assume this wasn't your first time acting. Can you tell us about when the spark happened for you and what the journey was like leading you into your first paid job? I'm going to go I'm going to go out <laughs> okay. on a there and say that was Cobra. No. <laughs> OK. <laughs> it, it, it is actually, that movie is based on a, a real uh, story. Um, and it was a guy named Ken Cobra, by the way, uh, who, who wrote for the Boston Phoenix, or he was a photographer for the Boston Phoenix. Um, but anyway, uh, I digress. My, my <laughs> first um, uh, spark, it, it, um, it, it came, of course, you know, like all of us at a very young age. My mother was an actor when I was a kid, and uh, she was in a play called The Gazebo. And uh, my father was a drummer. He was a musician. He was from London, from England, and had a very strong accent, talked like this. He was sort of working class British, you know. So we were going to go see my mum's show together. And of course, we were going to be seated right down in the front so we could see it. So we go and, and we get there. But one of the actors who had a very small part at the end was supposed to play a Brooklyn cop in this play, didn't show up and they didn't have an understudy. So my mother said, well, my husband's a drummer. He's used to performance. He's not an actor, but he could just walk on and do. He, he only had a couple of lines. He had to say, I'll take that. And that, that was his line. And it was a like surprise entrance that this cop makes at the end. So my mother says, you know, Ken, he's four years old, but he's been to a million rehearsals. He's seen shows so many times, you know, he'll be fine. Just put him in the front row all by himself and he'll be good. So she puts me in the front row. The play starts. My mother comes out, sits on this other man's lap, flirts with him kisses him i stand up point at her and go that's my mother and i'm telling my father and i stormed out of the theater to wild applause and laughter and i was like oh man what just happened and of course the other thing is my father tried to upstage me at the end of the play when he walked on because he entered the stage too early and suddenly there's these two guys trying to dig up money at the end. And the Brooklyn cop who's not supposed to arrive for another five minutes is suddenly standing on stage <laughs> trying to look invisible. And he got the second best laugh of the night. But as soon as this Brooklyn cop opened his, his mouth and, and said, I'll take that and that, 
he got applause. So I was like, this is the coolest thing in the world to do. And so that was the earliest spark, I would say, is that. That is the coolest. How did you get into acting store? I think we've ever heard. Yeah. That's my, yeah. you, I don't know if you know this. We have a store here where we make shirts from when our guests come on for things they say, and you just became a shirt. That's my mom. And, and I'm, I'm telling my dad. father, my buddy, <laughs> yeah, you just right. became a shirt. Awesome sauce, man. Awesome. Um, that, did your, did your mom explain to you what was <laughs> happening after the fact? Oh yeah, 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 yeah. And, and, you know, I saw her in a million shows later and, and, and just always <laughs> thought it was the coolest thing in the world. So I was one of these kids that when I would go to a friend's house, you know, like, um, I, you know, you get that age as a kid where you start to go and stay overnight at a friend's house or you have dinner at their house, you know? And, uh, I was always perplexed that, other kids' families did not suddenly break into song and dance around the kitchen. They didn't, you know, throw costumes on and run around. I thought everybody's family did that stuff. And uh, no, it wasn't true. So it was, uh, it was kind of a weird world to live in as a kid, but uh, it's now paid off. Yes. Yeah. I'd say I, I sincerely hope that that is, that that that's the answer isn't the lie. <laughs> the first one, oh, that better not be it. You can't start. Yeah. <laughs> All right. In 1990, you starred as David Ormsby Gore, friend of uh, JFK, in the ABC television miniseries *The Kennedys of Massachusetts*. Uh, this was actually Casey Affleck's second role of his career. This was like a, this movie had a runtime of nearly five hours. This was like a miniseries, and um, you're in each of the three parts, and. Uh, you know, ABC is reputable is a reputable production house. They probably weren't um, you know as big as they are now, post Lost and everything then. But but still, what was it like as a young actor tasked with portraying a real life person in such a uh, production of of this size? Uh, you know, it, it's funny because you you used the word. Um, you starred in. Uh, <laughs> we catch hell for that all the time. I think you catch hell. Yeah. You know, because <laughs> I call all of the, many of these appearances, um, you know, because I do a lot of stage work and, and other stuff. And when I'm in film or television, they're usually pretty, pretty quick uh, moments, you know. So I call them my Where's Waldo appearances. Um, so this Where's Waldo appearance, uh, back then i remember it pretty well because they actually they they put me up in a very fancy hotel in uh, newport rhode island overnight and you know I, I wasn't used to i'd done a lot of um you know low budget theater you know and um when when you do a movie they they treat you so well you know like they give you a really nice hotel they pick you up they treat you like like you're in assisted living or something, you know, it's like, <laughs> you need anything, you know, what can we get you? They, they, they cloister you in this little room waiting to go do your thing. And they have to walk you there in case you trip or fall, you know? So, you know, I'm not used to that. And then the other thing is as David Ormsby Gore, who was, I think ultimately this is way back. So I can't remember everything about him, but I think he was, it became an, an ambassador and stuff, but these are the hoi polloi. So I'm dressed in a like tuxedo type thing and all that. So I felt weirdly out of my element. Also appearing in it was uh, Michael J. Fox's wife, Tracy Pollan, I think is her name. Mm -hmm. And she was very nice, like so sweet. And she's sitting there with us and she's, you know, I'm with suddenly famous people, you know, and I wasn't that used to famous people at that point, you know, yeah. and I'm sitting there and she's got this wig on. I think I can't remember who she's playing, but um, I don't know who she is. I can't recognize her because of the wig and stuff like that. And, you know, they serve us this amazing meal and uh, she's sitting across from me and, and uh, she says, um, <clears throat> Oh, wow. Look at this food, you know? And I'm like, Oh yeah, it's great. I said, I, I only do this for the food. You know, I don't do this for any other reason, you know? And I thought, Oh, she'll get a kick out of that. But it was like, she didn't look at me like, like that made sense to her. And I, it was the first time I realized that when doing these movies, 
um, there's like a hierarchy that unintentionally, and it's nothing with Tracy, it's not her fault. It's just that I think when the people who are very, very well known um, are doing the film, they're looking all the time to figure out where's their group, you know, like, and everybody's mm -hmm. looking for their group. And uh, that's what I remember about it, you know, uh, like as a young actor going into that and just going, who's who and who's important. And, um, you know, I guess the, the first thing I learned uh, from that was everybody on a film or TV set is super important. Like you treat mm -hmm. everybody like they're really important because you, you do discover sometimes that that young person who's the, the production assistant who's walking you from your trailer to the set, that could be the niece or nephew of the director, you know, mm. just, or a producer who's just yeah. breaking into the business. So both from a kind of networking point of view, but also just like, you know, your attitude on set, you know, not to be dismissive of other people and stuff. So I don't know, that's a long winded way of saying the thing I learned there is you don't know who anybody is. People have wigs on, you don't even recognize them. Mm -hmm. uh, that's my thing. All right. It's like going into the cafeteria of, of acting school. Like you, like you say, you're trying to find your root. Which table is mine? Oh. <laughs> can't sit here. Can't sit. <laughs> now, now, let me ask you this. Now, in 1992, you played the character Harv and Frank Oz's house sitter with Goldie Hawn and Steve Martin. Talk about a film with star power and Frank Oz. What was that experience like? And what was it like literally being directed by Yoda himself? That technically makes you Jedi, right? That's a horrible Star Wars. Yeah, that was a, yeah. I, I, I that's like only what I can't do. I can do everybody except Yoda. Yeah, Give me yeah, an effing yeah. break, man. Yeah, don't try that. Yeah. <laughs> me no try. I'm getting better. See? No? no? <laughs> wow. <laughs> You're bringing back great memories, though. And uh, Frank Oz is a super super cool guy like like very cool and very 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 nice um that movie a weird thing happened i auditioned for a completely different part i auditioned for the part of the um the the therapist the counselor that um counsels uh goldie hawn and steve martin frank oz cast me and so then he called, then they called me a couple of days later and they said, oh my God, there's been a mistake um, because Frank cast you through the, the Boston casting director, but in New York, they'd already cast Christopher Durang to play um, the, the marriage counselor. Mm -hmm. So Frank feels terrible. So they've created another part for you, uh, the hardware store clerk. And they're inviting you to be the rehearsal reader, which meant that me and this fabulous actor who, who I just think is incredible, uh, Cherry Jones, um, the two of us got hired not only to do our small parts in the movie, but to be there for two, for like a week or so of rehearsals. And oh my God, I've never been so re nervous for a rehearsal in my life because it was Steve Martin, Goldie Hawn, all that. And they were a friggin' blast, man. Uh, the two of them together, Steve Martin comes in in this amazing linen suit, which he immediately takes the jacket off of and it's gorgeous and he sits on it. So now he's now ironed that jacket into this big wrinkled mess that later he'll put on. But that guy is a very, very hard worker. Like he was working that script every minute with Frank. Like, you know, they said, let's do a, we'll do a one hour lunch break. And, and Steve, no, half hour, let's do a half hour. And let's, uh, Frank, let's go and we'll work. And he's got his laptop and was in the early days of laptops. I was like, wow, you got a laptop or something special. Um, it must have been heavy. <laughs> oh, yeah. And, uh, and then Goldie Hawn was a riot, and she was one of the producers. So, you know, at that point in my life, I had always thought Goldie Hawn was, you know, sort of flighty, but not at all, man. She was, like, producing this movie with, uh, with amazing people. They were all great. Um, there was a hurricane during the um, – the, the the shooting of the, the film, which 
which was shot on Cape Cod. And they kept delaying and delaying and delaying my scene forever. And uh, they basically cut it down to, I think, one word. Um, and I was on the set. Oh, and this is my other claim to fame around that movie, which is Goldie Hawn's daughter, who was a little kid. Uh, what's her? Is it Kate Hudson? Yeah, is that yeah. Kate Hudson. Yeah, yeah. Kate Hudson was a little girl, and she had a little bicycle, and it broke. And I'm a big bike person and was a bike mechanic, and I fixed her bicycle on the set. That's my claim to fame from that movie. But they delayed the shooting for so long, I still get really great residual checks from House Litter. Um, That's all awesome. From- it's planes, trains, and automobile, the truck driver. Yeah. Yeah, you just say, hey, man, no, yeah. it's, it's, let the storm ride out, brother. Let it ride out. <laughs> <laughs> let, awesome, the, let the storm ride out. <laughs> awesome there. Are you taking your little notes here? Yeah, I'm, I'm, be taking, I'm not taking notes. I'm just trying to, I'm trying to keep, keep up. Yeah, man, it's all up here, man. So. This is this is a really weird game that we're playing <laughs> with the because now I'm like I'm I'm looking for you to lie and I'm never I'm never doing that with the guests like it's always I take their word for it but now I'm like is that no you're looking for an actor <laughs> which is even harder yeah. hey are you gonna guess at the end are you gonna guess oh, oh yeah, yeah you we're, we're gonna do you that have end. to know. Yeah, we're going to give our we're, we're going to put our heads together and give one answer. And if it's if it's right, let us know if it's if it's wrong. Let us know. Yeah, right. We don't want to we don't want to put that out there. OK. All right. Um, so this uh, this was an uncredited role. Uh, I guess the 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 where's Waldo where Waldo wasn't found, you could say, from 1996 uh-huh. in the film Big Night. Um, but we love connections here. We were curious if working on that film with Tony Shalhoub in any way led to your role in the episode of Monk um, in 2002, where you played uh, Manny. Totally. And I mean, this is one of my, you know, it's so funny because it's an uncredited role, but it actually was a monumental uh, time in my life and a really, uh, you know, when we say, when I was saying this thing about, um, sort of finding your place in in the hierarchy of of movies and when they're being made and everybody's so careful about who everybody is and what's happening. That was such a friggin' great thing to be a part of. Stanley Tucci and I did a play that originated at uh, Yale Repertory Theater. It was uh, Scapin, directed by Andre Belgrader, an absolute genius of a director and the acting teacher of... Tony Shalhoub, Fran McDorman, Leif Schreiber, um, you name it, Andre Belgrader is like all of their acting teachers. And uh, he cast me in the show back in 1990 or 91. And Stanley was in it. Um, uh, great cast and it really terrific people. So um, we did it at Yale Rep and it was very successful. So then we did it in New York where it was also equally successful. So Stanley and I became friends and uh, Stanley said, hey, I'm making this movie. I don't have a huge budget. Would you want to come and just sort of be there and we can improvise some scenes. And if we put it in the movie, I'll, I'll pay you as a principal. And if not, you'll just sort of function as an extra. And I'm like, oh, I'm so down with that. So we shot on the... Uh, the low west sort of where they shoot law and order and stuff at the piers we shot down there and um they created this incredible set i could go on and on about this movie so stop me at any point because it really was uh, a highlight um we will never stop you so you're gonna have to exercise restraints (laughs) (laughs) oh my god it was just so great (laughs) Because if you've seen the movie, you know it's it's got Ian Holm, it's got Isabella Rossellini, it's got uh, Minnie Driver, and and the whole story of Minnie. And and when we did the show in New York, Scapin, she came to see it be, long before we shot Big Night. She came to see it, and we would pull people from the audience, and we pulled her up on stage with us one night, and that's how she and Stanley met. Um, and that was what made him go, oh, she had just made this movie, oh, Circle of Friends. Um, and she was telling us about that afterwards because we talked to her. And uh, so then Stanley knew she was an actor and, and realized, oh, I got a cool part for her to play. So anyway, we did that movie. Um, <clears throat> I had so much fun 
Uh, Mark Anthony is one of the coolest people in the world. And can I tell you one stupid, this is the stupid guy story. This is how stupid I am. This is what I'm, I, I was trying to get at with the Tracy Pollen thing. So here's this young guy, young skinny guy who's playing like the bus boy in the movie. And I think, you know, he's like me, you know, he's like friend of Stanley's got into it. You know, he's improvising some scenes and stuff like that. And one day Mark is sitting there, we're having some food together on the, the set. And, and he says, Oh, I got to get out of here early today. And I'm, and I go, Oh really? You, you're leaving early. They're letting you go. And he goes, yeah, yeah. I, I got a gig. And I'm like, you do? Oh, I said, what, what's your gig? And he goes, oh, I'm, I'm a musician. I said, oh, no kidding. He says, yeah, yeah, I'm playing a gig tonight. He goes, hey, you want to come? And I'm like, oh, maybe. I, I don't know. You know, it's like we're probably going to go <laughs> long. You know, hey, I, I, I'll get you in. I'll get you in. And I'm like, I don't know. Like, no, don't bother. Cause I'll bet we're not going to get out of here till late, whatever. So then we're talking and he's such a cool guy. And then um, he, he says, Oh man, I, he says, I think, I think I got to go. So we walk out, I walk him out and you walk out of the piers and there, there's sometimes limos and stuff pulled up. So there's this huge limo and the door opens and these people like his entourage gets out, you know, but I don't know it's for him. So I jokingly, I tap him and I go, Hey, look, man, your car is here. And he, goes, yeah. <laughs> like that. And he gets in it. <laughs> and I'm like, wait a minute, where's he going? <laughs> he goes, and I'm like, that was weird. Like, why do you have that big car? So I go back. I am so embarrassing myself. But anyway, I go back and uh, I get onto the set and everything. And I don't think much about it. And the next day I'm on set and I'm like, where's Mark? How come he's not here today? And somebody goes, oh, well, his gig went late last night. And he, you know, and they said, you hear about it? And I'm like, hear about it? What do you mean? And they said, you didn't see the times. They said, he said, he sold out Madison Square Garden. You couldn't get in. <laughs> I was like, what? So anyway, um, had a great time when Stanley uh, cut that film uh, the first time. It was four hours long and um, he cut everything way back and all my stuff went out the window. Um, and, but it was one of the most delightful, positive movie experiences I've ever had in my life. Some has me thinking that he he wishes the lie was that that story didn't happen with Mark Anthony. He wishes yeah. that that was the lie. That's, I'm going to go and catch that one off the list. I wish <laughs> that was the lie. Um, <laughs> well, the, the, uh, that was the Tony Shalhoub question, right? Like, I uh, yes. Say, so <laughs> you reverse, oh you reverse so of course I met Tony <laughs> then. Uh, I met I, Tony I, I, then. I'm and then grateful then. for the Mark Anthony <laughs> story, <laughs> but I'm still left wondering how uh, we're looking for the Tony Shalhoub <laughs> <laughs> we went there. We, it's, it's in, we circled right back around. So let me ask you this. From 1997 to 1998, you starred in 13 episodes of a series called The Story Shop, credited as Prospero J. Pickwick, as well as a host credit. It is a fascinating premise, but we had a little bit of trouble finding information about it. Could you tell us a little bit more about the production and your role in it? Yes. I think, you know, I told you my mother was an actor. She was also an educator. This was a children's television show that was made in oh, probably in the 1980s. It was during the George, Bo the first George Bush uh, administration. And, this aggression um, will not stand. Yeah. <laughs> and um, there was a guy named Bill Bennett, who was the secretary of education. And um, I got a call because I used to do a lot of work with kids. I used to do these theater projects and film projects and stuff with kids Um in elementary schools, right into, you know, kids who were in lockup, who were in junior high school and all kinds of crazy stuff I used to do with these kids. So I had somewhat of a reputation for doing that kind of work and they were looking for a host for a children's television show. So they called me in to, to do that. Um, and I, I got the part and then the head of the program, um, calls me into, the, he's like, not the head of the program, he's like the head of the educational network or whatever it was that we were working for. He calls me into the office and he says, uh, Will, 
he's from Texas and he's got pictures of George Bush and him shaking hands with Bill Bennett, the secretary of education. And he says, uh, I was very impressed by your resume, young man. You're, you've done a lot of work with children and uh, I see you've raised money and gotten grants to do all this work. And we, we're very impressed and you've got acting credentials and I think you're going to be a wonderful host for these kids, but I want to get some stuff real clear with you right now. He says, uh, you know, this is a television show where we're going to review books about children for children. And he said, we're not going to do any of those books like my two mommies, are we? <laughs> and I'm like, are you serious? <laughs> I, I, like I went, I, I remember just standing up like, bye. I'm leaving yeah. like this. And I started to walk out and he goes, now, wait, 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 wait. We can negotiate. Uh, we can talk. <laughs> and it was like this negotiation to get me to say yes, where he said, you can, you know, we'll, we'll talk about this as we go on, you know, and maybe there'll be some changes or whatever. So I stupidly agreed. The show was so, um, that's my wife in the background that you see. There. Oh, did you see our eyes are burning? Okay. Uh, like, yeah, so I saw both your eyes. The <laughs> well, Give them away, Paula. <laughs> I was about to say, I think your house is haunted. <laughs> Something's going on. <laughs> Something's going on up there. But anyway, what uh, what happened was we did the show, and it was, I have to say, it was so terrible. The show was so bad. My mother, the actor and theater educator, never watched one episode and never watched a single one afterwards. So the reason why you never see it anywhere is because really it was, it was not a good television show. Oh, well, moms love everything. Tell I know us, moms love <laughs> everything, especially my mother loved everything. She couldn't stand that. Show. It's oh, a great uh, origin story. At least I know we're not doing two moms. moms are we? This ain't the reading rainbow. <laughs> <laughs> oh, now, now let me ask you this. Now around that time, also in 1998, you played Wayne Finn in Leslie Lincoln's Gladders, The Proposition yeah. with Robert Legia, William Hurt, Madeline yeah. Stowe, and Kenneth Branagh, who we loved, of course, intended. That, that I cannot tell you how we really loved him in Tenet. Now, Leslie Linker Gladder has essentially gone on to direct episodes of some of the most fantastic shows on television. What is it like working on a project when you're surrounded by such high caliber talent? Have you ever borrowed any trip uh, tri tips or tricks that you can share with the audience? Oh, my God, that's a great question. I, re you know, that was another one where I'm sitting around a big dinner table like big night and I just look around the table and it's like, Oh my God, I'm with these really fabulous people and they're all marvelous. And, and, uh, uh, you know, Leslie was kind of early in her career at that point in directing that film. And, um, you know, I think for directors too, the, the, the question that you're asking, like as an actor, what's it like to be around with those people? It's hard when you're a director to have to tell William Hurt, Madeline Stowe, you know, to, to tell them what to do and like, mm -hmm. Ooh, I didn't like that take, you know, that's a hard thing to have to do. So I think if anything, I remember watching her negotiating that and finding her way, even, you know, I, I was probably there for three nights or something to shoot that scene, two or three nights, just watching her negotiate that. And I have a feeling uh, she was getting her chops during the making of that movie. That that would be the thing I learned from that one. There are other ones, and I think you're probably gonna ask me about other films, but there are definitely things I pick up from from all these incredible people I've been lucky enough to be around. Yeah. I could I can definitely identify with that. Uh it, it's kind of like an imposter syndrome feeling like um we've made a few movies and there's yeah, you know, there there have been it's on a different level, but you know we've had actors that have worked on like a walk on part on like a Michael Mann production, and in the back of my mind I'm thinking like they've got to be looking at me like I I'm not a director even I'm directing this movie but I'm not a director they've been directed by Michael Mann who the hell am I to tell them to do this or that. Um, it usually turns out that every actor just wants direction. It doesn't really matter where it's coming from. If the direction is clear, if it, if, you know, if the director believes in the vision and they can convey it well, it really doesn't make a difference how many credits they have. What's that motivation? 
<laughs> yeah, yeah. Where am I? Where am I coming from? Um. Uh. So we're still in 1998. I think we're going to be in 1998 for a hot minute. It was. Oh, a, geez. Okay. <clears throat> Um, you start in a short film that has such an interesting premise. And I, uh, when I was reading about it and the behind the scenes is equally as intriguing. So I don't want to spoil anything, um, for people that have not seen this because I'm hoping that people are going to go watch it when they see this. And I'm going to put the uh, link to the Vimeo in the uh, description of this, but, um, it's essentially begin the, the, sh the short film begins with a school receiving a VHS tape from the future recorded by one of their current students an adult in the video. Um, the recording warns them about an imminent school bus accident that will cause the death of 50 students. It's called Bobby Loves Mangoes. You play the man on the tape. Um, Stuart Archer, the director, managed to get Bobby Love Mangoes, uh, his first film, um, Out the Gates, into the hands of Roger Ebert, Tom Cruise, uh, among others. Uh, he's working on some great stuff to this day, so it's awesome to see someone shoot for the stars and actually land on the stars. Can you talk a little bit about that project, again, without spoiling anything for people that haven't seen it? Uh, but really, ma mainly aside from the premise of the movie, what it was like working on something that was so truly independent like that. Uh, you know, I independent film and you were just saying, uh, Durden, that you, um, you know, you've made some films and, and uh, I don't know if you've ever seen the film living in oblivion. Uh, no. Oh my God. You guys have to see that. And it, it's a really great film made by a guy named Tom DeSillo who has a great website called Drunken Film School. Uh, Tom, <laughs> yeah, is, Tom is an amazing filmmaker. His stuff is terrific, really terrific. And you will see in his movies people that have become very famous. Uh, but Living in Oblivion is a fabulous film about making an indie. And um, it, I, I actually very fortunately ran into Steve Buscemi one time after I had just screened that film for some students. And I said to him, Oh man, I said, it's so funny. I, I, I've been staring at you for like a day because uh, I screened this film and we talk about it a lot called living in oblivion. And he goes, Oh my God, it's one of my favorite movies that I've ever done. And it really is terrific. And I think you guys would love it. So anyway, I check it out. Love no. Steve Buscemi. Yeah, so the whole thing of the indie thing, I had just done a, an indie called Next Stop Wonderland that went to Sundance. And so I'd gone to Sundance and on the plane back, this kid, like looked like a high school kid, comes up to my seat and starts talking to me, like giving me a script and I'd love you to look at this and uh, I'm a filmmaker and I, uh, you know, uh, would you be interested in... Um, you know, uh, a part in it and, and stuff like that. And I'm like, oh God, well, cool. I guess this is what comes from doing a film at Sunday and suddenly everybody's giving you a script or whatever. I thought this is kind of cool. I'm riding this high. So I take it and I read the script and it was really interesting. And that was like very cool. The concept is very cool. And um, you guys just articulated it well. It's, it's like this weird sort of back to the future, weird thing that's going on. But anyway, um, I agreed to do it. Uh, Stuart was very innovative, uh, very driven, um, you know, really wanted to make a great movie. And, you know, I, I'm not totally crazy about this analogy um, just because it's sort of aggressive. But I took a film course once with a very good director, uh, film director, who said go, making a movie is like going to war um, because you don't want to send anybody into the trenches for something they don't believe in because you're giving up your life and you're mm -hmm. going to need a lot of resources. You're going to need a lot of people around you and you want everybody to be committed. Uh, what was very cool about Stuart is he has that drive that, you know, he's going to get that movie made come hell or high water and he's got his idea that he believes in. And I think that more than the money, more than anything, if you're going to make independent movies, you got to have that. And you got to get everybody on board with you. 
And that was Stewart's uh, forte. And he did great. The movie, I think, is very cool for, for how old he was when he made it. I think it's mm-hmm. excellent. It's excellent. Yeah. 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 <laughs> it's, it's, yeah, it's produced well. I mean, and it's, it's the perfect premise to reel you in on this, like, fantastical story and how it ends just it it's well, it, it pays off <laughs> <Spoiler> <laughs> I, you you brought up uh, having that uh having that support system and you know when you go all in with it i'll say his wife has been one of the biggest since i've known him for almost 20 years now his wife has been on every ride he's been on so whether she wanted to or not and, and and you can't get these films done without having a great support system so you hit that right on the head you no kidding yeah absolutely Absolutely. It, the, because, your, your whole support system, and it's no joke when we say, because <clears throat> my mother died a year ago, and um, other than the story shop, uh, she was, you know, biggest supporter. And, and I think sometimes uh, one of the great things when, when I'm making a sacrifice to, you know, doing a film or doing, you know, the hard work of doing some of this stuff, it's like, can't wait to see what my mother thinks. You know, it's like, it's, it's more for them than for anybody else. You know, it's It's, really for, for the people in your life. It's amazing how the abundance of audience really makes no difference to the performer. Like we only need one. We only need this. Like uh, when when my uh, 16, 15, 16 years old, back when we were making movies, short films on VHS tapes, you had, we had one VHS tape when we were done with it. And it would go in my now wife's mailbox. We I'd drive by like this. We were making shorts for her. Like it yeah. was just, uh, it was you know, inside jokes in them and put it in there to call her up. Like, what'd you think? Like, all right, let's make the next one. And that, that was having one person that was excited to watch what you do made it made it now don't get me wrong it feels really good to walk up to a premiere with 250 people lined around to see what you've made but it, you really only need one person well, to your point though you don't get to the premiere without having that vhs and for the kids out there a vhs is a form of media that you can <laughs> use a long, long time ago <laughs> all right so before last question i promise that 1998 i promise we're leaving getting our time machine let's go all right okay, for 1998 for one more question low iguana from what we can tell this oh, appears God. to be a chill children's series, not the two moms thing. This appears to be a children's series that was locally produced and aired in Boston. You're credited as playing yourself. You appear to be the face of the program along with your co-star, a puppet iguana. Can you please tell us a little bit more? Yeah, I'll, I'll be brief on this one. Uh, only in that it's another one of these children's television shows that uh, how, how good it came out, I don't know. But um, it is based on a real thing that happened to me. Um, I have this incredible cousin who uh, moved down to, after all kinds of catastrophes in her life, moved to a Caribbean island, St. John, where she'd gone for her wedding. And uh, she moved down there, an amazing story of, of her move for there, where they parked this trailer thing on the edge of a hill and all of her worldly possessions slid off the side of a mountain into the ocean when she moved down there. But she sort of rebuilt her life down there and she was working at this cool restaurant called Skinny Legs. And I was like, I want to go down and see what it's like her living in the Caribbean. I'd never even been there. So we flew down and we went there and we visited and we had an amazing time. And we rented this amazing place that was way up on top of this, like a mountain. And uh, there were all these iguanas that were in the kitchen. They'd run through the bedroom. They, they were everywhere. And um, I'm a New Englander. I wasn't used to those. But uh, I thought they were really cool looking little critters. And uh, in the morning, I'd get up and I'd have my cup of tea. And I'd talk to them and have, you know, little chats with the iguanas and stuff. And I felt like I, it made some friends, you know. And uh, when we flew back, I'm in my place in Boston and I open my suitcase and what leaps out? Oh God. A freaking iguana. With you. <laughs> and I'm like, oh my God. And I chase it around the room and I capture it. And I'm like, what do I do? You know, so I got a terrarium for it. I put it in a thing and I kept it. And then this friend of mine who's a children's uh, book author came over and he sees the iguana. 
And he's like, where'd you get that? And I'm like, oh my God, it leapt in my suitcase. And he said, oh, we should write a children's story about it. It's an iguana that wants to be an actor. And so he jumps into an actor's suitcase because he wants to be made famous. And so uh, he, he travels with him like this. So we write, he writes this children's story and he gets it illustrated. And we go around to these elementary schools and we do readings of it and stuff. And word gets around that this guy who did this other kids TV show is going around with this little iguana. So some guy from New Hampshire who was doing a thing on child safety and stuff like that, got in touch with me and uh, said, um, Hey, we'd love to do a show uh, with you and this iguana. So they made a puppet and uh, I actually gave the iguana to one of the schools. It lived for like many years. I can't remember how many more years it lived, but I gave it to a, an elementary school and we, did a, a season of a television show based on it and it didn't come out that good. In 2003, you played Tim Robbins' character's friend at the bar in uh, Clint Eastwood's Mystic River. Uh, what a fantastic film this was with so many great actors. Again, um, I don't want to spoil anything for anybody, but I cried for Tim Robbins' character, Dave Boyle, um, at, at that point in the movie that people who have seen the movie know what I'm talking about. Um, but the uh, the movie plays out like a masterpiece. It hits all the right chords. What What's it like to work on that movie? What's it like to work with Clint Eastwood? It's so weird. These Where's, Where's Waldo appearances have allowed me to, to be in the proximity of a lot of people that I'm like, oh, my God. I can't believe I'm turning and looking over there and seeing this particular person, you know. So, mm -hmm. um Clint Eastwood probably more than anybody else was that way for me. And I would just say if there was a moment where I just sort of wanted to reach over and rip off the rubber mask that somebody was wearing to look like Clint Eastwood. Because I was like, that's not actually Clint Eastwood, is it? Um, yeah. But it really was. And he's, oh, God, very cool guy. Very, very cool guy. And always my fear when I get cast and things like that, where I haven't met the director yet is I'm going to show up and he's going to look over and go, Oh no, not that guy. I didn't want him. <laughs> That's not who I wanted. So I was like terrified. He was going to reject me that I wasn't right, you know, and all that. So uh, once I got over that, Tim Robbins is very great, you know, and, and he wanted to sort of improvise talking the accent, uh, the Boston accent before uh, we shot the scene because I think it was the first scene he was going to shoot. And Clint Eastwood, as you may know, is one of these directors that doesn't call action. Mm -hmm. um, all of a sudden the camera's running and he does very few takes, very few takes. And everybody knows about this and it gives his films a very raw texture. He doesn't yeah. want it to feel like a Hollywood film. So, um, Tim and I are, are, are sitting next to each other and we're improvising in the Boston accent and the whole thing, talking about the baseball game and stuff. And then all of a sudden we hear very softly and go. And both of us catch one another's eyes and it's like, I think you just sit and go. And, <laughs> and we are like, oh shit. Like, I think we're supposed to act now. And I have the first line. So we don't say anything, but it's like, okay. So we start going. We start talking. We do, do the scene. And then uh, I hear Clint go, okay, we'll stop the camera. Like that. And it's like, stop the camera. I've never heard that. No cut, no nothing, you know. And then he comes over and he goes, uh, that was good. Let's loosen it up, have a little more beer, you know, drink a little bit more like this. And he's just talking to you. And it was like, I suddenly realized, I wondered if it was all those years of doing Westerns, because he was like a horse whisperer. He yeah. was like horse whispering. That was how he directed. Everybody, it was like you were a horse, you know, and it's like once you endow him with that authority. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> you like, it's like I gave him full authority. He was so, he's so in charge, you know. So and the assistant director is like, you want to run that again? Nay. <laughs> <laughs> now, I think there's one thing about Clint Eastwood. He doesn't, you say he's cool. He doesn't call action. Action calls him. <laughs> Ooh, 
That's yeah, a good one. Keep action, that. When, when you are <laughs> action. <laughs> yes. There you go. Now, now staying in the theme of films that are directed by people we commonly think of as actors. You played Jimmy Fuel, Jimmy Fuller in the Tim Blake Tim Blake Nelson's Leaves of Grass with uh, Edward Norton, who's a friend of the show, and I, Edward Norton. Yeah and Edward Norton, which premiered at the Toronto International Film Festival in 2009. What was that production like and how was it to work with uh, Tim Blake Nelson? Oh my God, talk about like fun and like an incredible human being. Uh, I, I, you know, it's fun to do this little retrospective with you guys because it's like, all these people are so much fun. I, I mean, really, incredible people I've gotten to be around. And uh, you interviewed Lila Robbins. And in doing that, then you create a three-dimensional person. And uh, Lila uh, was in the production of Midsummer Night's Dream that I did with Tim Blake Nelson in the park in, in New York. And uh, we were the mechanicals in Midsummer Night's Dream, which usually when you're playing the mechanicals, it was Jesse Tyler Ferguson, Jay Sanders. We, uh, we had a really great group and, and Tim was our leader um, in that group. And we had so much freaking fun because basically your stuff is to come on. It's like being in a comedy where you're the comic relief. So mm -hmm. people are laughing, but you're going to get them really laughing and that's your job. And it's the best gig in the friggin' world to also do that in Central Park in New York. So you can't help but bond with everybody that's in that show with you and, and, and just love them all. So Tim and I actually kind of knew of each other a little bit. He'd seen me in that production of Scapin years ago and had been a big fan of that show. And uh, so we, we share a kind of similarity in that we get cast in these kind of odd clown like roles too so we hit it off great we've remained friends um and then he said to me at the end of the run he says uh hey i'm writing this movie i got a part for you and it's like i'm always terrified of that kind of thing because then my hopes get sky high mm -hmm. and uh and i really wanted to work with him again and sure enough, he calls me down to audition for Avi Kaufman, who's an extraordinary casting director in New York. I think one of the absolute best. You watch every show uh, that's really great uh, that's on Netflix and stuff right now. And 90% of the really good ones are Avi Kaufman casting. So I go in, read for them. I didn't feel like my audition went great or anything. I didn't hear from him for a while. And then finally I called him and I said, oh, I'm so sorry that it's not going to work out. And he's like, what? No, you're in, you're in. So went down, did that film down in Louisiana and Edward Norton, I have a fight scene with them. And mm -hmm. that terrified me because I saw Fight Club and that man is skilled. And I'm like, I'm good. I'm trained in that stuff, but I never know how um, people are going to approach a fight. You know, like to me, it's like, that's the time you're most careful. Uh, mm -hmm. not when you're out of control. And sure enough, uh, Ed had had his nose broken uh, when he was making a film and he had to break my nose in this one. And just before he brings his fist back to do it, he looks at me in the eye and he goes, are you nervous? I'm going to hurt you. And I said, <laughs> no, I said, I trust you. He goes, good. Cause he said, I had my nose broken. I'll never break anybody's nose. And boom, <laughs> goes like that. And he gets like every time he was so perfect. And we had a frigging, frigging, blast making that movie just really really fun that's that's awesome i i, I have to wonder when you say that he somebody broke his nose I'm, i was the camera rolling or not yeah. that's i know that's where you're going <laughs> and maybe you can dispel a little bit of this but we talked to uh well there's there's rumors out there that edward norton can be challenging to work with and uh we talked to lisa gorlitsky who worked with him on rounders and um she more or less confirmed with with it very gracefully confirmed um but it sounds like you had a great experience with it oh my god i i i you know i think everybody's experiences on all of these things vary and you know it's a hard it's hard making movies it's hard doing this stuff and man as hard as it is for people like me who come in and there it's its own thing you know like doing a law and order, for example, which I've done a bunch of those 
for those of us that go in and do those day player things and stuff, it's terrifying because it's like literally jumping onto a moving train that is just flying down the tracks. Mm -hmm. And everybody on the train is all settled. They're in the dining car. They do this every day. And all of a sudden you're going to jump on, go for a ride and then jump off. I often say it's like going to a, uh, a Lakers Celtics game sitting down in the front row. And all of a sudden somebody turns and looks at you and goes, you're in (laughs) and you got to jump in and play, you know, even if it's just catch the ball, pass it to somebody else. Like, that's all I got to do. I don't even have to take a shot at the the basket. (laughs) You know, I just got to, I just got to pass the ball. I got to dribble it once and then I'm out of there. That's Mm -hmm. what it feels like sometimes. So, you know, Edward, is carrying all that weight, all those people who do the leads in these TV shows, who do the leads in the films, all the weight's on them. So they're carrying it. And that tension is going to do different things to different people. Now, Mm -hmm. I think I got lucky. Tim and Edward are both very good friends and they were working collaboratively together on the film and both had committed that thing that I'm saying when you're doing an an indie, how everybody's got to be on board. They were so on board with this, having so much fun. We had Steve Earle in it, who's a freaking phenomenal guy, an amazing musician. So it's like the vibe was good. But the thing is, Edward is like what I said about Steve Martin, about all of these people. He freaking works. Like Mm -hmm. that guy is, so that challenge that, People go, oh, that person's challenging to work with. He's challenging himself 10 times more than he's challenging anybody else. And to me, it's like, all right, you're going to be that challenging. I got to rise. It makes me Mm -hmm. only better, only better. So it was my pleasure to work with him. And I hope I didn't drive him crazy because, I mean, he's so good. And I, I scramble sometimes to keep up with people who are that good. <laughs> oh, what a, what a, what a great time. And, you know, like uh, Tony Shalhoub doing Monk with him. I mean, he was every freaking scene. He's in every scene. Can you imagine that? Like, it's, you're in oh, every yeah. scene of a television show. You never get a break. We stopped one time to have lunch and we're sitting there. We're going, phew. He literally had just gone, phew. We get to, we get to talk for a minute, you know? And then somebody runs over and goes, um, Tony, Entertainment Tonight is here. Um, they want to interview you. Uh, and then we've got to run and do a reshoot on a previous episode. We've got to shoot a little thing. Here's the script. Take your lunch with you. And it's like nonstop, nonstop. Mm-hmm. That's a lot to care is a lot it's got to be frustrating too if you're like a perfectionist like edward norton and you're that hard on yourself to give every moment 110 percent. it's like if you're working with a co-star or a supporting actor who's got you know a five minute part in the movie and they're not bringing 110 percent. it's like i'm i'm carrying this whole thing 100 percent of the time at 110 percent I'm just asking you to show up for 5% and give it everything. And like, if they, they sense any kind of like hesitate or holding back or uh, yeah, I could see how that would be like, dude, you're ruining this. I'm bringing everything and you're not meeting me. I'm, you know, even less than halfway. Absolutely. That's cool to hear is I I love Edward Norton as an, he's a, 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 ever, I mean, ever since I saw him in primal fear, it just like blew my mind. I lose time. I lose yeah. time. And then Fight Club. Yeah, he's yeah. just. He's a dude. He's a man. And a great director, too. Don't forget about Delta Smoochie. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right. Uh, released in 2010, you worked on Martin Scorsese's Shutter Island. Uh, at the time of production, Scorsese has already been directing for over five decades. So, what is it like to take direction from someone like that? And was there any sense of uh, intimidation working with? I mean, he, when you, I swear, if you had a uh, dictionary, it's like right next to the director, there's a picture of Martin Scorsese. He's just like the director. So uh, it, I, I'd imagine that'd be very intimidating. It is. And I, I, I think, you know, it's funny on the heels of this thing about Edward, um, the people who are real incredible 
uh, I don't know if the word is talent. I don't know what it is that, that, that moves them into that category. I do think a lot of it is hard work, really hard work. And it's, it's deep passion that drives them to that place. Um, Martin Scorsese, if we were, because the art of film, it's only, uh, you know, about 120 years old at this point. Um, and so we're very fortunate. We also live in a time where we can Netflix just about any movie or YouTube any movie and, and see all kinds of amazing films. But Martin Scorsese would be considered like a Rembrandt, a, an early master of the work, you know, like a really amazing uh person who just set the bar really high for everybody else so I knew that going in because I love film and and of course every one of his films I've seen them and and learned about his process and that so part of it was intimidation and another part of it was absolute exhilaration I could not wait to be there um, and also the the actors who were appearing in the film with me were Ben Kingsley Max von Sydow who as a young person uh, I saw him in Bergman films and just thought, oh, my God, he's like an icon of acting, Kingsley. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, uh, Leo DiCaprio and Mark Ruffalo. Um, so it's like, wow, these people are going to be in the scene with me, directed by Martin Scorsese. Yeah. Is there a level of intimidation? Yes. That's the jumping onto the, the court with the Lakers and Celtics and catch the ball and pass it. And that's all you got to do. Well, Sometimes that's not so easy. <laughs> so anyway, uh, the trick is to just breathe. But this is a tip for all actors, okay? I, I now call this the Ben Kingsley downshift. Scorsese, as those of you who know how he makes films, he layers his films. He, he Every element of the film is integrated to the rest of the film. They're all little fractals. It's like physics. It's like everything's built in. Like that man's brain is going a billion miles per hour. So he's creating a storm around us. He's creating, uh, you know, everything. And he gets it from every angle. And he, just extraordinary to watch this guy at work, to just watch him. I was like, sometimes I forget I was there because I was supposed to be acting because I'm just watching the process. And um, the, he shoots so many angles so many times. And we're just doing this scene around the table like 15 times, you know, and um, or more than that, like all day long, two days maybe. Um, and we're just shooting the scene. And Ben Kingsley, every time, is in the moment, like, perfect, 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 perfect. And we get to this one point where I look over at Ben Kingsley, and I see that look that you sometimes see in an actor's eye of, like, whoa, where are we in the scene? What, where are we? And I see him realize, and he's not speaking this point. It's going to come to him in a second. And the camera's on him. And it was just that little fleeting moment. And maybe I'm wrong, but it sure looked like, where the fuck are we? And I see him trying. Now, if that were me, I would have gone into overdrive. I would have shifted into, if there were a sixth gear, I'd be in it and revving the engine. So that, <laughs> you know, this feeling, right? So <laughs> I'm like, oh God, I'm terrified. Well, I look over and his response is to do the downshift. And he just goes, and he listens 10,000 times more to everything everybody else is saying from this place of just listening. And I can see he still doesn't quite know where we are, but he's listening and listening. I say my line and I look at him and all of a sudden the, the words just come out of them like, oh, wow. And it was like, had to be the take they used. It was so like just the way he just went. And I was like, that's why he makes millions of dollars for a movie. It sounds like a simple thing, but his mm -hmm. capacity to listen and his ability to breathe, oh, shite. You know, it's yeah. like, that's ben it. Ben Kingsley's downshift. Yep, I like that. I would, I would say I would say I downshift while you you upshift. You, you <laughs> like I, I don't know. I 
I somehow lost my place here. I'm going all in on this. Here we go. This plane has no wings. It's now a <laughs> torpedo. Let's go. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That, that's amazing, though, to be yeah. able to to just put yourself in the moment and almost like he's forgetting that a movie is being made. This is just a conversation happening and he's relying on all of the studying that he did with the script to bring him back to like what's happening mm -hmm. and for it to happen just in time like that. That's awesome. That's, yeah. Let, let, let me bring you, I know we stayed in 1998 so long, so we're not going back there. Don't worry about it. In 2014, <laughs> you starred in the HBO miniseries Olive Kitteridge as uh, Harmon Newton alongside Ann Dowd's Bonnie Newton, along with, of course, Francis McDormand and Richard Jenkins. Yeah. <laughs> Can you tell us about what it was like working on that production? That's the dream right there, you know, like you just said it. Um, I had a moment, we have that scene where we're all, at the, you know, all these scenes I have there at tables, you know, um, tables with really great people. And um, maybe that's a really incredible thing because, you know, when we think about it, who do we, we were saying, who are these films for? Who is it? It's like, who are the people we invite to the table? You know, mm -hmm. who do we have dinner with? Who do we have dinner with every night? You know, um, our intimates, you know, the people we share our lives with. And um, they have this, I love the book. I think Elizabeth Strout did an amazing job of creating a world that that it's just so deep and, and intimate like a like a an Anton Chekhov short story or something like just a deep thing and I love you know great literature and that it, it, it had that element and so she captures moments and there's a moment where we were going to shoot uh at sunset in the restaurant because the sun would be going down behind um, Olive and her husband, Richard Jenkins. And so they were shooting our stuff first and then we we're all waiting for the sun to go down at the right point to shoot their reverse. And we just were talking because I've known Richard Jenkins actually since I was a kid. He was at the theater that I grew up around, the theater that my mother was at when I was a little kid called Trinity Rep in Providence, Rhode Island, which had an amazing bunches of actors uh, Peter Garrity, Richard Jenkins. I mean, the list goes on forever, but um, Richard was by far one of my favorites. So it was such a pleasure to be working with him at that point and like just to see him across the table from me. Fran is a great friend of many friends of mine and I'd never met her and have always just adored her work, like just deeply honor her work. She's also a student, former student of Andre Belgrad, or my close friend, who's this great director. And so just felt a kinship with her that was just extraordinary. And then Anne Dowd, oh my God, she's like, she's she's it. You know, that's that's the kind of actor. So I'm there, I'm blissed out. <laughs> doing that. But I'm playing a guy who's miserable. He wants to get out of that relationship. He's in a mess. He's a bit of an alcoholic was how I interpreted it. You know, he runs a hardware store. You know, it's like, it was just such a weird thing, like dropping into that head of like, I'm in the honeypot right now. And yet uh, I, I can't see it. I'm, I'm yeah. so unhappy, so unhappy in my life. But um yeah, I don't even know what your original question was other than I got to tell you, that was that was a great experience working with that guy. No, that's cool. That was perfect. That nostalgia that's moment. He got next to you. Like, you know what, man? Just what it was like working with that production. Yeah, I mean, I couldn't imagine. So, I mean, you got Aunt Lydia sitting next to you. Oh. Uh, and then the sad guy across the table and the hilarious. Like, I, I, I love uh, Richard Jenkins and Francis McDormand and uh, Burn After Reading. Their chemistry oh. that is so yeah. fantastic. Yes. So yeah. good. Now, everything um, Richard does is so fabulous. I love him. He's, and everything. Yeah. He's such a natural. And he's just what he's what he's got one of those faces. They're just like, oh, man, I hope you're doing all right. <laughs> you know? He is, man. He lives a good life. He lives a very nice life. He's got a wonderful family. He's just a super good human being.
I'm happy to hear that. But yeah. at the same time, he could definitely be the face for a pharmaceutical uh, for depression. <laughs> like, hey, work still coming in. <laughs> yeah. His life got you down. David O. Russell, uh, oh. the he, this is one of my favorite directors. And um, I Heart Huckabees being one of my favorite movies. Um, I've heard he can be, again, we're going to use the word challenging, a challenging director to work with. Uh, what was your experience like working with him on uh, Joy in 2015? I, you know, it's so funny that I, I wish I had, well, just to, to contrast, I wish I could think of like somebody that really did drive me crazy. Uh, I had an opposite reaction to, I think, a lot of people to David O. Russell and his direction. Um I went in to audition for uh, him and I had just found out that a close friend um, had uh, been diagnosed with cancer and I was not in any mood for bullshit basically uh, and literally had just found it out. And I had uh, bought uh, a thing, a little angel wing. Oh, I have it. Uh, I had bought this. I bought this. So mm -hmm. this is an angel wing and it's a left angel wing and it's made from recycled computers. It's silver that they recycle out of computers. I think in Mexico, uh, people uh, started a business collecting trash and, and making uh, jewelry. So I bought this at an arts fair and I bought a right wing for my close friend who had cancer because he and I, despite our close relationship, are ideologically completely opposed. So he's a right winger and I'm a left winger. And um, so we argue. But the thing is, the angel doesn't fly unless it's got a left wing and a right wing. That nice. was our, our hey. feeling. So I drop that every United States. So, so we're like, okay. That's it. We've cleared restaurants, by the way, of all our other friends who call me the next day and go, are you guys OK? And I'm like, yeah, why? What happened? We don't even know because <laughs> we're, we're screaming at each other. So I, I that friend had been diagnosed and it really freaked me out. So I walk into that audition and I don't know, there was something that David was it seemed equally pissed off at the world or something. I don't know what it was, but he, he was in the mood for no bullshit too. And it was like, Oh good. Somebody else doesn't want any bullshit. Great. What is it? <laughs> and he wasn't looking at me. He was looking at the monitor. And I think at a certain point I'm supposed to like, he starts reading with me and improvising. And I'm like, look at me, you know, like I, I didn't say that, but I was like, Hey, I'm over here, you know? And uh, I don't know. I walked out, of that audition kind of going, well, they're not going to hire me. I'm such an asshole. So anyway, uh, they did hire me and uh, they hired me to play a bit of an asshole who gets Jennifer Lawrence arrested. Um, and uh, we did, that was the last day they shot in Boston. It's a thing called French hours where if you're, you're going to work all day, I think it's a 10 hour day and you're going to work nonstop. Um, you get paid a lot of money for doing this. Um, no meal breaks, no nothing. But at the end of that 10 hours, the crew and everybody puts down everything. And that's the end of the day. So mm -hmm. you must do it in 10 hours. So they were on a must do. And it was all my scenes all that one day. And Jennifer had, I think, uh, been under the weather. I think she'd had a flu or, or something. And so um, she was, you know, her energy uh, the the day before had been pretty low, but she came in, man, she is, no wonder why she's a superstar. I mean, for somebody that age, that woman is so together and mm -hmm. so good, like really good. Like I, I go, wow, I've been doing this for a long time. I even like pretend I teach it, you know, and it's like, she's so good at it. She's so good. Yeah. And she's really great, you know, like good to work with. Wonderful. So um, not hard on the eyes either. Oh, she's just, yeah, she's got everything. She's got everything you need yeah. to be a good movie actor, you know? And, um, and so I was prepared for how he was and he's very, he's very gruff, coarse. He hated what they put me in. 
Um, so I walk on, he goes, I hate it. Uh, he sends me away. Does it twice, three times. He's, he's screaming at the customer. And finally, I knew the customer from another thing. And I said, you know what? I know what he's looking for. And I said, I brought everything I wore to the audition. It's in my trailer. And I said, and I have this necklace. And I had that on that day. I'll bet if we put that stuff on, he's going to approve it. So he finally the customer throws up and he says, send somebody to trail, put it on. So we put it on, we put this in, I walk in and he goes, now that's it. That's it. That's it. That's perfect. <laughs> like that. So then we're in, um, he does weird shit to you. Like he'll say stuff like, what's that? Your radio voice. What's that? Your radio voice. I don't want your radio voice. Just talk to him. You know, like he'll say, and, and then he looks at me, he goes, uh, does that bother you when I talk to you like that? And I go, <laughs> no, not really, even though it really did. Made me nervous. But he goes, uh, well, I talked to George Clooney that way. He said that. So <laughs> Are I'm you like, George Clooney? <laughs> yeah, right. So I'm like, okay, if you talk to George Clooney that way. And then our final scene, we're running so late, he's going to, you know, we got we to gotta stop in 10 hours, you know. And uh, we're going to shoot the scene where I get her arrested in the warehouse and all this. And all of a sudden, the script supervisor runs up to me and she says, look, David wants to cut these lines that other people have. He wants you to say this. He wants you to do this. And he wants to change that line. And she gives me all this stuff to do as I'm standing on the other side of these double doors where I'm going to go in and catch Jennifer Lawrence in the thing. And so I'm like, what? So she goes, yeah, yeah. So you're going to say all that. And I'm like, Whoa. And he runs over. He says it to me. He says, oh, here's what I want you to do. say. That's da, da, da. And he walks away. And I look at the script supervisor and I go, did you, did you write that down? Like, what, what do I end up saying? And she goes, oh, no, I didn't write it down. I go, well, how am I supposed to remember that? And she goes, oh, nobody ever does. So she goes, he's <laughs> going to change it. He's going to change it when you're out there. And he says, and she says, and when you're out there, if you don't get it right, he's just going to yell at you and yell the line and have you say it until he likes it. And I'm like, what? And she goes, yes, yeah, that's the way he works. And I'm like, you're kidding me. And she goes, he does it with Bradley Cooper and he got an Oscar. <laughs> so I was like, all right, holy shit. So those double doors swing open and I have no idea what I'm about to say, but I start grabbing lines that I can remember that he told me. And Jennifer is like, I want to get out of here. I want to leave Boston. I want to go home. We've made this movie and she's, we're both kind of saying what we think we're supposed to say to each other. And then every once in a while, David would yell, let's do it again. Say it this way. Say it this way. And, and it was a friggin' blast. I thought it was hysterically funny. I would hate to be the editor who has to cut his voice out because he does kind of sometimes overlap you a little bit. So I'm like, Oh shit. I should say the line twice. So you say it twice or whatever, but it was just cacophony. And I love chaos. I actually think chaos is a really great thing because it creates real human behavior. And mm -hmm. um, we got to the end of the scene and uh, I, you know, Jennifer gets dragged out and um, thrown in the cop car and driven away. And they go, that's cut. That's a wrap. We made it in time. She bounds up the stairs, gives me a hug. She goes, we did it. We got it done in a day. And I was like, yeah, this is cool. So <laughs> I had nothing but fun. And then uh, I'm driving home from the set and I'm the local hire. I don't feel like I'm anybody special. So I just leave the set and I'm driving home and I get a phone call and they go, hey, where'd you go? And I said, well, I'm heading home. And they go, um, well, David wants you to go to the rap party tonight. And they were having a little rap party. And um, I said, can I bring my wife? And they said, of course you can, you know. So we went and I had a friggin' blast at the party and he was really, really nice. And so sorry, he may be challenging, but he's another That's really awesome, hard man. worker. I think, uh, I, yeah, I think it makes sense why a lot of, why he gets that reputation because it sounds like he just doesn't, he doesn't put on the facade that most people do when they're like, I, and I, I appreciate when someone's a dick to my face, I'm like, okay, they're, they're honest. They're, they're, they're at least real. Mm -hmm. I can trust what they're saying. I can trust when they say something nice because they're not afraid to be an asshole when they're feeling like, being an asshole like and i'm not mark Wahlberg, so you could be an asshole to me as much as you want to <laughs> um that that's that's yeah that's how that's a fantastic story um 
Yeah, David O. Russell, what a treat. Um, in 2016, you played a reverend in Comedy Central's uh, miniseries that was released on April 20th, The Time Traveling Bong, created by uh, fantastic Broad City's Alana, Gra Alana Glazier. Um, we can only imagine the antics happening on a set like that. Does any particular memory come to mind from that production? You guys are making me realize I, I've been so lucky. So lucky. <laughs> because number one, I think Broad City's a freaking riot. I, I love the show and uh, the performances are terrific. The ideas are great. Um, just so much cool shit. And I think they, they, they broke ground in terms of what, what gets done and, and stuff. And also I discovered with um, time traveling long, that a big part of that is Lucia Agnello and uh, Paul Downs. Um, mm -hmm. Lucia is the director and Lucia is just ah, my kind of like, that's the kind of person I love working with in such a good way, like challenging on one hand, but just free and open and, uh, incredibly adept and you know um there's the show she she's doing now called hang um is it called hang hacks i think it hacks yeah hang is the play i'm about to do i think it's called hacks it was uh, a really great cast and everything and um i did a, a reading of the pilot for her and um she's just you know she remembered me from the thing and brought me in to do that um the, they're all really fun. Alana Gleiser's just a riot. We got to improvise and mess around. And Paul Downs is like, I'm big fans. What can I say? I'm just big fans of, of everything they do. And I'll always be watching their stuff. Is there a lot of imp uh, room for improvisation on the uh, the time traveling bong? It seems like they're, they're big on let's try something. Yeah, they are like, um, I also did another show that didn't run that James Corden was producing. It was done as a BBC series called The Wrong Mans, and I really wanted to do it. Um, but Showtime and all that never got picked up. But uh, the, the way that we were doing that one was um, you would uh, do your scene, do the lines. And um, once we got that and felt good about it, then we do one more for improv. And so that's, that's kind of the way Alana and um, Lucia were working too. We, we'd get it done and then we would, um, and then we would uh, uh, improvise a little bit. It's always fun when you know you have what you need in the can, there's no pressure. And that's sometimes when the best magic happens when you're just completely loose like this is just for shits and giggles yeah i like it i enjoy it all right now we noticed that you often work with director john stimson from yeah. 2018's ghost light and 2017's the spruces and the pines to 2012's sexting in suburbia one of my favorites and 2006's the legend of lucy keys along with his first film a short call the winter people released in 2003 now is there a story there that you can talk about the benefits that come with working with a director multiple times like i have i'd imagine that the, a relationship builds to where more can be communicated with less words uh, he, he is, he is a Massachusetts filmmaker who is so respected by everyone in Massachusetts. He, his set is a delight to be on. He's a very, he's just, a, he's a sweetheart of a guy. His movies are, you know, tend to be these kind of lifetime movies, which are a kick to do because, you know, uh, they're the kind of thing where I, I like it because I get to play the nice guy that could be the, the guy next door who could end up being the murderer. You know, it's yeah. like they're those kinds of things. So they're very, it's very cool. I, he's found a niche for himself in terms of the kinds of things he does. He either does sort of weird uh, horror -y, uh twisted movies, or he'll do, um, ones that are uh you know like christmas movies like spruces and pines it's um, totally bipolar <laughs> yeah it's totally bipolar it's, it is um and he's this very kind of sweet 
put together kind of guy. Um, and he's also an avid uh, bike rider, which I am too. So several times um, before we do a movie together, we just go for a bike ride and talk about the script and, you know, you're hammering up these hills and you can't talk anymore. And then on the way down, you, you, you talk about the movie, you know? And so, mm -hmm. yeah, he's a great, good friend. That would be, uh, yeah, I could imagine um, a lifetime esque movie would be fun to be, be an actor in because it's, you kind of get to, um, it's like somewhere in between stage and, and film where the way you're, everything is a little bigger and yeah. a little bit more over the top. I could, I, I could imagine that would be, that'd be fun to explore that kind of, that, that part of the craft. All right, let's get into the reason that we contact you to be on today. We are covering The Invention of Lying, released in 2009. This is unnatural. Why am I wearing clothes? How do you people live like this? This uh, is such a funny concept to me because it's it's not it's not the, the the religion or the political ideology that sends somebody to the street to start screaming. This presents the uh, the idea that the religion or political ideology just gives some somebody something to holler about that would have been hollering anyway. When I saw, like, I remember the first time I saw Invention of Lying. Your 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 little Where's Waldo moment was one of the like magic moments for the movie for me because that that it said so much and you're passionate like you brought that passionate energy to this even though you're like as if you were yelling about the end of the world mm -hmm. but you're just yelling ob obvious like it's it's just, it was just such a comical moment to me that made the movie uh that enhanced the movie so can you tell us a little bit about how you got that role what the audition was like um for a part like that were you asked to come in a room and just scream stuff or you know how did that play out you know i it I hate to say it. I, I'm, I'm kind of recon. I, when I when I was thinking about that, I was like, "Wow, reconstructing that audition." Um, I mean, certainly Ricky wasn't there, so I was probably auditioning for the New York casting director with the the Boston casting director, and um, so I'm trying to remember. I think. I think it was like you had to improvise a little bit around what you were given. You know, I, I, I if I recall, there was room for improvisation. Okay. And uh, that was also, it, it was borne out on the set too. So mm -hmm. I think there were the lines that were given and then you had a little bit of license. Uh, you know, I think they were looking for maybe a particular energy, which it sounds like you were picking up on when you said, when you saw the film. And so I think they probably thought, Oh, this six foot three guy standing on the side of the road in a suit screaming that at the top of his lungs, that could work well. So I think it was an energy. Yeah. Yeah. You definitely brought that sense of like somebody that is so overly confident in the things that they're saying, that they're willing to scream them to passer passers by. And when, I, yeah, when you I was just waiting on to be like, he's coming. The return is near. I mean, when you said that, I'm like, wait a minute. No, that's the exact opposite. Like, wait a minute. We were born without clothes. <laughs> we were homo sapiens. Let me ask you this. Did you try out any different lines or did they like when you did this? Like, is that the one that landed or was it always that? Well, this is, you know, in terms of like, and I think it's Ricky's, is it his first directing game? Right, first time. Mm -hmm. I yes. think it Feature was. Film, yeah. And he was working with, uh, what's his name? Is it Matt, Matthew? or uh, uh, so Matthew Robinson. Robinson. Oh, there you go. It's in my book. That's outside. Yeah. <laughs> so it was like, you know, it was like two friends, you know, working together mm -hmm. on this movie and, and making it happen and that. So again, as somebody who likes chaos and likes the chaos of, of film. And I think that that does lend itself to, you know, improvisation being used on film. You got to have that love of the, um, the chaos uh, that that's happening around you. And so I could feel Ricky's way of working was like, just let's get some stuff generated here. But again, that idea of, okay, we have a script. If we can get what's in the script, 
we're golden. Okay, but then if we can make a little free form, let's make some free form. And so when he was doing his things, um, I could see that uh, he was leaving room for other stuff to happen. So I thought, oh, hopefully when I do my little bit, we'll get to do that. So sure enough, when we did, we shot it one time and they were laughing and seem, seeming to like it, him and Matthew. And then uh, at a certain point, he goes, you know, do what you want. And so we're shooting in Lowell, Massachusetts. And across the street are all these people who live in Lowell, Massachusetts, who are watching them make the movie. So I thought oh, I'm going to try to get them to take their clothes off. <laughs> so that, so I'm actually, so I'm yelling at the, the bystanders, you know, from Lowell, seeing if I can get somebody to take their clothes off. If I look back now and feel like I have a regret, I feel like I should have been ripping mine off. I should have ended that naked. I really should have ended it naked. It's probably the one regret of my career is that I didn't go all the way and just strip my clothes off and get naked. I think Ricky would have loved it. I just didn't have the the confidence at the time uh, to yeah. do that. But anyway. I could see that. Yeah, I mean, I definitely see that to be in a, a wise decision. But I personally like the fact that you're screaming these things about why are we wearing clothes while not taking your clothes off. It's almost <laughs> like that projection of like, I don't know if I really believe what I'm saying. I'm hoping that yeah, they believe, you know, you, you will. Yeah. You can tell that it was so natural because when I watched it, did a rewatch the other day, you can tell Ricky G is not, doesn't know you're going to say that. Cause he walks by, he's like, <laughs> like, like he, he didn't yeah. know that that was going to happen. It's very rarely he gets thrown off, but I can tell that somewhat surprising what you were saying. Like, take your clothes off when we're wearing clothes <laughs> let me ask you a question now do you have a favorite memory from the set other than being there work, working with ricky g and uh, and just you know keeping your clothes on obviously not taking them off but do you have a favorite memory from set of the production whether it's on screen or off screen i gotta say you know it was a pleasure when i did take a little risk and i think it's ricky who came up with the take your clothes off it's just mm -hmm. the way i was doing it and how i was phrasing it okay um, that was a surprise to him. But I just remember feeling uh, really good when I saw him and Matthew laughing, like they were restraining themselves from laughing while I was doing it. And that I would say was the high highlight, you know, just like, good, I'm doing my job. It's, it's good to make someone else laugh who makes you laugh all the time. It's like, right That's now, right. I, I, I'm, I'm at least trending in the right direction here. <laughs> there was, I got a, when we interviewed David Wayne, who's one of my favorite filmmakers oh. and just a funniest guy, he's made me laugh my whole life. And we were talking to him and I said, I said one little thing and he, he did the smallest little chuckle and my heart <laughs> fluttered. And I'm like, I could die now. I could That's die. It. I, this is it. Yeah. That's I how I felt, you know. Hours. If I can make if I can make him laugh even for a second, um, I'm happy. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, yeah. Let me ask you this: Before we move on from the invention of lying, is there anything else you'd like to share uh, that the the films of the fan fans of the film may not know about the film whatsoever? The, the, any inside information? I guess just a thing that I would encourage people to look for, and you, you kind of talked about that moment of like what happens to us when we believe the lie. I mean, given what's just happened in this country over the last five years or so, this whole concept of the lie and its power, mm -hmm. Ricky was a man ahead of his time there. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, so I would just say if there's, a, if there's a hidden jewel in there, it's like, look at it now. And mm -hmm. look at what he was asking us and what he was saying about the power of the lie and what we can believe. If it was released now, it would be called The Big Lie. Yeah. Uh, to, quote, to quote George Costanza, I'll bring up in Seinfeld anytime I can, to quote George Costanza, it's not a lie, Jerry, if you believe it. <laughs> or if I believe yeah, you got, you got to believe the lie. Like, it's not a lie anymore. Uh, I like how the French refer to it as, uh, we're beautifying the truth. Mm. Alternate. Yes, yeah. that's it. Beautifying <laughs> the truth. I like that. I'm yeah. keeping that one.
<laughs> um, and this, uh, the, this is actually a great segue. Um, it has been a while since we asked a question related to the pandemic as far as how it's impacting production work. Um, when I was doing the research on you, I noticed you had a, a pretty awesome like home setup for a uh, like self auditions and stuff like that with the, with the uh, uh, curtain behind you and the, the ring light. And um, we're just wondering, um, is that is that still the norm and do you like what direction do you see that going from someone that you know is working regularly it's a great question i you know and i i think for actors that's actually a, a really good question because we all do wonder when we're doing that i think uh, and i've had this conversation with other actors like what's the standard you know because suddenly the self-tape is becoming enormous so mm -hmm. Our initial impulse, of course, is to duplicate the uh, the feeling that we had when we went into a casting office, you know, which is a blue background or a plain background and, you know, some kind of a ring light and the, the thing. And um, yeah, I mean, so I mean, yes, that makes sense to go for the pro forma and, and the convention. Um, but I've talked to some other actors about this, too. And Sometimes because you're not walking into the room with them, because there is something about walking into that room where they're actually right there and you're right there. We get a sense of who one another is, you know, and all of a sudden in the Zoom audition or in the uh, self tape, that's gone. So, I think that it can come a little flat mm -hmm. and I can't say like, I mean, I kind of deliberately uh, set us up here because I thought it was an interesting background. So yeah, beautiful you house, by the way, you don't want to, you don't want to overwhelm your own image with what's behind you. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, I just did one, I, uh, I signed an NDA, so I can't talk about who it was for, but um, did one where I chose that time to go out in my gazebo thing there. And uh, it's got a nice screen and there's all woods behind it. So it kind of makes it look just sort of mottled green behind me. And it was a much kind of, it was a dad role and he was, um, a troubled guy and everything. And I think it just, I, I, I ended up in a room with the director for an hour uh, because of it. Um, and I think that it, it lent it, it would have been flatter with that fucking blue thing behind me. So I don't know. It's a mixed bag. I don't think anybody, if somebody knows the answer of what the perfect self tape is, God love them. I, I don't know. <laughs> It does add a whole lot more to the dynamic of the audition where it's usually like you walk in the room, they've, they've, they're set in the environment, mm -hmm. they can make their decision sometimes before you even start doing the lines when you just yeah. by the way you introduce yourself like all that's gone now and now you're left with all these decisions of how to creatively go about setting yourself apart, mm -hmm. or just playing it safe. Yeah, it's it's got to add a different a, a fun challenge, but a challenge nonetheless. You have actors the setting up their own lights. They're like, I got to get my three point light set up. Yeah. Wait a minute, is this thing is yeah. nice. I didn't, <laughs> didn't want to be a cinematographer. <laughs> that is speaking. That's a perfect segue. Let me ask you this: You worked on independent productions with low budgets, all the way up to Scorsese, from stage to TV to film. What is the best advice you have for aspiring actors out there? I know, loaded question, right? Well, it is a loaded question because number one. I, I, I am reluctant to give advice because I'm, I'm very suspicious of all advice. That would, that would indicate that I felt like I knew something. And I actually think a big part of what I feel the actor's responsibility in being as truthful, speaking of invention of lying, is that we don't know what comes next. We never know. We're in a state of not knowing. And when people start giving advice to actors that comes from a, I know, I think we send them down a weird road 
So the first suggestion that I would have for all actors is be very cautious of all advice because really if a, there's a lot of actors, I, I could make a long list of people that I think have extraordinary careers who broke every frigging rule and that's why they're doing great. And those yeah. are the actors that I'm most interested in. Uh, and so I think that means there's some, it, there's something that as actors we are listening to that's within ourselves and yet it's out there too. It's like this weird thing in, in, in finding that, that getting in sync with that. I'm still working on it. I'm still working on it, but that would be the thing that I'd say is just be very, be, be careful of advice and also be careful of making plans. I'm, I'm both a big fan of Mark Twain and I'm a Marxist. And Mark Twain said, if you want to make God laugh, tell him your plans. And I'm a Marxist in that Groucho Marx said, um, time wounds all heals. So when you run into people that are giving you grief, you don't have to do anything. Time will get yeah. them for you. You don't have to do anything. That's true. I yeah. like it. Follow the crime time. So, yeah. so <laughs> reserve, reserve skepticism for, from the advice of others and be uh, and trust your instinct, trust your gut. I've heard uh, Jay-Z says people will tell you how to do it and they never did it. Yeah. Like, yeah. <laughs> like, what are you, what are you um, so we got uh, we got four questions left here. Um, these are these are kind of quick quick bites. All right. So uh, you're going to be locked in a room for one year. You can only bring a single film with you. Which movie are you taking? And and we put it like this because we're not looking for the, we're trying to weed out like, because a lot of the, the, the film buffs, they want to say, you know, the movie that makes them look like they're, you know, a, a film connoisseur. We, we want to know the movie that you could watch over and over and over again. And over. Oh, wow. I love that you just introed it that way because there actually is a film connoisseur movie. There are two film connoisseur movies that I, I, I was like, oh, God, because I do think just in terms of could I spend hours watching it, just trying to figure out how they did it and, and what made it so marvelous. Um, mm -hmm. And one is Kurosawa's Rashomon, which I just think is and speaking of lying and discerning truth. Um, I, I think that that might be one that if I were to, as a film fan, like of, of cinema, that movie is like, oh, I could watch that again and again and again and again and try to figure out, wow, what was he saying? The man was a genius. But then there's a movie that really shifted things for me in my life that I could watch again and again, just because I do think it was great fun and it, it just popped into my head. And it's a movie with uh, Peter O'Toole and um, Mark Lynn Baker uh, called My Favorite Year. And it was eventually made, I think, into a Broadway show or something, but it's about acting and about chaos and Peter O'Toole is marvelous because it's in the 1950s that it takes place and he's this swashbuckling actor who like a Sid Caesar guy has invited him to be on a live television comedy show in the 1950s but Peter O'Toole doesn't realize that it's going to be shot live and he's a bit of an alcoholic going through uh, some personal stuff in his life and when he uh, gets there and they're rehearsing, um, he screws something up and he goes, oh, well, you know, we'll just retake that when it comes to it like that. And uh, they go, oh, no, no, this is going to be live. And it throws him into a state of terror. And it's just it's a great, great film and fun. So I could watch that again and again. Awesome. 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 Okay. So, so you were cast as Emma Roberts' father in a film called About Fate, which, yeah. which recently, which, yeah, we know, we do our research, which Whoa. recently began production. <laughs> what, if anything, can you tell us about that? And are any is there anything else coming up that you would want the audience or that you can tell the audience about? Oh, uh, 
I just literally rapped on this and it was like one of those really fun things sitting around a table at a wedding because I'm the father of the bride and um, <laughs> which is the bride is actually Britt Robertson and um, uh, she plays um, Emma's sister who's getting married. Um, oh man, I had a blast. Uh, Cheryl Hines is in it. Uh, Wendy Macklin showed up at, at the end to, to play a little thing. It's, it's really a, it was a fun, fun cast. We're actually, uh, those of us that are all the sort of secondary players in it, we're all housed in a room uh, in the hotel uh, as we waited to shoot our scenes down in the wedding. They would send us to this room, room 319, in this very fancy hotel. And we ended up laughing our asses off in that room uh, to the point at three in the morning where they came in and silenced us and locked us in the room. Um, <laughs> Quiet in the room. Yes. And we, uh, we're we actually thinking about writing a script uh, called Th Room 319, uh, which is uh, about, you don't know why these people who are all dressed like for a wedding and stuff are in this room together. Um, so we had that much fun and, and all the actors were a blast. Uh, I think it's going to be a very funny rom-com thing. Um, yeah. And, and some young actors, you know, that I just, I can't, I, I marvel at people who are like 30, nothing and so talented and so good. 30 at it. nothing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I've never heard of that. They're 30, nothing. <laughs> Room 319. That sounds like a great idea because you open up, you see a bunch of people dressed for, for a wedding. You think it's, yeah, that's one of those pull the rug out from under them. Yeah. And then every once in a while, somebody comes in and goes, you're invited. <laughs> and you go yeah. out. And then when you come back in, you kind of come back like Kramer like, like, whew. And everybody's like, how yeah. was it? <laughs> that would, yeah, that would be great. That's something that I'm sure actors would definitely appreciate. Mm -hmm. um, all right. We are at the, uh, but before our final question, um, it is now time for us to see how well our, our human lie detector is. Now, before we do this, did you, did, was there a lie in there somewhere? Yes, there was. Oh my God. Okay, I beautified so the truth. I'm oh, sorry. Okay. I beautified the okay. truth. <laughs> Okay. So uh, give us 10 seconds to do, do, right. do, do, do. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm going to either Kate Hudson or Mark Anthony. I was going to go, he didn't fix that bike or Mark <laughs> Anthony. So I think I know where we're going. No, I, I don't think Mark Anthony invited him to this show. So you think Mark Anthony is a lie? No, I, okay. I think he's okay. lying about being invited to the show. Yeah. About okay. not knowing who Mark Anthony was. So you think that Mark Anthony was the lie? That's yeah, yeah, oh, yeah. I thought you, I thought you yeah, asked me if Mark Anthony was, was Kate, a liar. I think it was Kate Hudson because I wouldn't <laughs> make up that story about Mark Anthony. I would. Uh, if I'm, somebody I, asked me to lie, I, well, I, it's one, two, three, go. <laughs> one, three, right, right. <laughs> one, two, three. <laughs> all right. <laughs> all right, man. Fuck this. All right, yeah, listen. All right, no. We, yeah, we didn't rehearse that, by the way. All right, we're, we're going to be here all day. Less words. All right, we're going to go with uh, <laughs> or, we don't have to do it together. We can both be right or wrong. <laughs> but we we are we have one unified answer. Okay, so what do you want to go with? Okay. All right, Mark Anthony. Oh no, it's not. You're you're wrong. Was it Kate, was it Kate Hudson? No. Oh, so, so all of that I was, was for nothing. nothing. Yes. <laughs> okay, which, which, which did we, uh, what, what, what was the lie? There was no iguana that jumped into my suitcase. And oh, my God. Gosh. Are you kidding me? You told that so beautifully. Yeah, yeah. When I got know. home, there's an iguana. In my it's one of those things where you make the lie so big, it has, it must be true. That, you got oh, us there. Was, there was you no iguana that me? jumped in my suitcase. That's a you didn't give an iguana away to a school? There was no iguana that went to the school that you gave no. away? Yeah, he immediately had to tell multiple lies. Just to, <laughs> just and I think, it, I think it lived for a few years. I just gave it to a school. I'm like, man, that's such a humanitarian. Man. <laughs> Jesus. Good, you man. know, that that's the problem man. when you tell a lie, then you got to keep telling lies on top mm -hmm. of lies. On top oh, of man. Lies. And have a really good memory. Oh, sorry, Mark. 
You're great, by the way, Anthony. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you for that. And sorry to the school out there that never got the hypothetical. <laughs> one. We'll send you one. So, um, so let me say this. Uh, uh, in closing, uh, do you have any? This doesn't have to do with uh, have to do with film or anything. But in closing, do you have any parting words? Not not any advice, life, because we know you're not giving life. Well, maybe a quote, a poem, or a song that or something that you would like to leave with the audience. Anything that you can think of. I guess the only thing I can say right now is uh, this has been an absolute pleasure. Thank you very much to to both of you. I, I know, look, this is the weird thing about the whole Zoom thing. I, I don't know what it is that I, I feel like I've actually had a nice time with you guys uh, mm -hmm. over my kitchen table. And so I, I, I wish it had been in person in the flesh, but um, I, I, I feel like I looked at a couple of uh, the episodes that you've all done before this, and I loved your your, your energy, your enthusiasm. You're your, your in your you know. I think we share something in common of just appreciating the the interesting stuff about making films and and television, and it's 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 great. I just love what you're doing. So thank you very much for having me. And uh, I look forward to uh, more of your stuff. Thank you again uh, for coming on. It was a it, it was a sincere True pleasure. pleasure. Yeah. Yes. Listen, when we we're gonna we're gonna be doing movies in the future, we would love to have you come back on sometime if you have the free time. We thank you for it. Oh, I'd I'd love that, you guys. And thank you. you <laughs> it's such great homework too, man. I can't believe how much uh, you you had. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank, thank you. you. Have a great Take care. Enjoy all. the rest of your weekend. Thank you. Yes, you too. Bye now.